thank you for that nice introduction, but thank you, most importantly, for uh, putting this event together uh, and for inviting me to be a part of it, and, and for all of us, inviting all of us uh, to be a part of it. I've been so impressed with everything so far, and I love the room and all the energy here. And um, so you got to introduce me, but uh, I, I'll, I'll let me do the, you introduce yourselves. So uh, the great thing about the Carpentries is that it's always active learning. Uh, and so we want to start this off by having everyone participate. Uh, so we don't have a chance to necessarily go around the whole room and have everybody introduce themselves to each other. So we just want you to introduce yourself to the person next to you. So someone you don't know. Yes. Um, so turn to them and tell them your name, where you're here from, and one thing you're proud of that you made. So it doesn't need to be a carpentry thing. It can be, you know, your bed this morning, something you did, a curry you made last night. Uh, so go ahead and, and talk to someone you haven't met yet. Awesome. I did this kind of thing in a room of like hundreds, and I started it, and then I went, shoot, how do we get everybody back together again? <laughs> so I employed a, a trick from, from my daughter's school. So, um, <laughs> hey, there's a reason they work. Um, great, so uh, it's exciting to hear we never want a quiet room. It's exciting to hear all of you talking to each other, and I just, I really can't wait for this conference. Um, so I am really delighted to get to, to start us off today um, and have the opportunity to give a little bit of a different talk than I might give in another setting um, because you, there is more familiarity uh, with the concepts. So um, I really do want to start, though, where I usually start, uh, which is really important around the, the space that we have right now is that we now have data and tools to advance progress and address questions in science and society. And this is sort of a, a unique place in history in terms of the availability of these things uh, to answer questions that we haven't been able to answer before. Um, and so there is a lot of conversation in the space around um, data availability and uh, software development, and these are all really important parts um, of this ecosystem. Um, and so sometimes we talk about you know, bringing compute to data or data to compute, but the real power, how we turn uh, data into information and information into knowledge, is that we need to bring people to data. So the question then becomes, how do we empower more people, culturally and linguistically diverse students, to use data and software to answer questions that are important to them? And what is really exciting is that the people in this room are committed individually to answering this question, to working on this, and that here together, this is a question that we're thinking about, of course, every day, every minute, right? No. Uh, but this is a question that I think brings us here together in this meeting. And so we're bringing not just our individual perspectives, um, but together are thinking about how we can approach this question. And so that's why I want my, my sub-theme of my talk to be uh, teaching together and learning together. And this is a photo from Carpentry Con from last year. So who are the Carpentries? Um, so the Carpentries is an open global community teaching researchers the skills to turn data into knowledge. Um, and so the Carpentries is this umbrella organization of software carpentry, data carpentry, library carpentry, Carpentries to be developed in the future. Um, and what holds us together is this, this community and the approach to how we teach and how we learn. So together we have this shared mission, and I'm guessing that not many of you have had a chance to actually to read the mission statement, so I wanted to share it here because this mission statement in and of itself was a, a community endeavor as we were forming the Carpentries, uh, where people gave feedback around uh, the important things that we wanted to do and how we did them. So I actually want to take a minute and read it. So the Carpentries builds global capacity in essential data and computational skills for conducting efficient, open, and reproducible research. We train and foster an active, inclusive, diverse community of learners and instructors 
that promotes and models the importance of software and data in research. We collaboratively develop openly available lessons and deliver these lessons using evidence-based teaching practices. We focus on people conducting and supporting research. So this is, there's a lot here um, that is important to us as a community and as an organization in terms of how we operate um, and what we want to do in the world. And through this approach, the curriculum, the instructor training, um, we've taught, um, we have more than 1,600 instructors, uh, the more 30 to 9,000 learners, and I think actually we're 1,755 workshops um, since 2012. And these are workshops all over the world. So this is a map that Francois Michonneau put together um, that shows uh, the workshops as they've happened since 2012. So you can see reaching new regional communities. As soon as you get Antarctica, you get a lot. It's only one workshop in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> so we've taught workshops on seven continents um, and are continuing to be able to expand uh, the regions and people that we're reaching. And so when we talk about teaching together, um, this scale, you know, this number of workshops, these different regions, that's a part of teaching together because together we can reach more people. But the important thing also is that we have a shared approach to teaching, and that how we teach is as important as what we teach. So um, I just want to reflect for a minute, and, and this section is going to be a little bit of a reflection on that, because I think sometimes uh, you know, we think about the practices and we put them into place, and to step back every once in a while and think about um, why these principles are important and how they come together, and how it helps us feel about our learning. So who in this room has been in a course or workshop where they felt like they didn't belong there? And then how many people then left that topic forget forever or for a while? So when we think about that question and we think about the learners that we're reaching, um, that how we teach, do you feel like you belong, is as important as what we're teaching itself. If someone's experience with teaching leaves them to leave rather than stay and want to learn more, then how can we really think about that as teaching, about sharing knowledge, about empowering people? And so it's this idea of, I think I can. We want, as we thought about the carpentries, it really started with a set of curriculum. Um, but what we've really found to be important is building this idea, this I think I can, that our learners leave the workshop feeling that this is something they can do, something that they want to do, that they're excited about. Um, and so it's not about teaching a specific set of skills, but building confidence and self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is this idea that you can do it yourself. And a lot of these principles um, come from, uh, first, you, if you're an instructor, you've seen this first book, um, How Learning Works. Um, that has a lot of information for us around um, educational pedagogy and approaches to teaching uh, that are based in, uh, based in research in terms of keeping people engaged and learning effectively. Um, but this other book, uh, Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain, is, is a newer one um, in our community. And it's talking about um, inclusive teaching practices uh, for culturally and linguistically diverse learners. And as we read this book, we saw that a lot of the principles in our uh, instructor training are already included. Um, but this is another element around teaching that's important for making people feel like they belong in our classrooms. So as we work towards this confidence and self-efficacy, uh, we use an inclusive pedagogy. And so what I've thought about, these are the four A's, accessible, approachable, aligned, and active. Uh, so accessible, uh, available in a time and place where a person can attend. So that's our short format is something that we embrace um, because it's something that people can, uh, can come to. That is welcoming. We have our code of conduct. We do our introductions at the beginning of your workshops. Um, and then accessible is also meeting and proactively ensuring accessibility needs. So, thinking of these things in advance um, so that people can find the workshops uh, accessible. Approachable, 
So is this something people want to do? You know, are they intimidated before they even walk in the door, especially around uh, data and software? Sometimes even just the title of the course, right, can mean that you don't think you want to go to it. So in our advertising and recruitment, feeling like the training for you is for you. You know, who is this for? Why should you come? Um, meeting learners where they are. So this is something we're talking about in curriculum development. Where are our learners? Let's meet them there and build from there the skills rather than sort of jumping ahead and, and not being in the right place. So really understanding our learners. Um, helping to overcome activation barriers to getting started. That's one of the biggest challenges. A lot of times is where do I start? What should I do? Um, so we want to provide this on-ramp uh, to these skills. And then one that we always really emphasize in instructor training, the mistakes are the pedagogy. So when we make mistakes, embracing those um, as a part of the teaching, showing how we recover from those mistakes, and showing that we do make mistakes. Uh, we see time and time again the kind of um, things where people tweet about, you know, someone like, you know, Hadley Wickham, who's really uh, in the R community, says, you know, I just have I've written this package you know, and every time I have to Google how to use it, um, reflecting that experts still ask questions, still make mistakes, uh, and showing that that's a part of the process. Um, aligned. Uh, so we want what we teach to be aligned, again, um, not just around the skills, but what people want to learn, what they are looking to do with them. And so we saw a lot in that mission statement right now around the research community. So we're thinking now, what is it that researchers want to do? How can we help prepare them to do the things that are important to them? So we want to teach with data sets that are relevant to our learners, teach skills and perspectives relevant to their current work. Um, then we have peer instruction, so instruction instructors that are current in their field. So this makes a really big difference. You are all instructors, you're all engaged in research. Um, so when you're teaching people, and people ask you questions, they say, you know, how do you do this? Oh, I use this, right? or you have an empathy and an understanding about uh, what the learner is going through, and that makes a really big difference from the instruction perspective as well. And then teaching current tools. So we don't wanna necessarily teach something um, just because it's like the foundational thing. What is it that you're using in your work? Let's teach that. Here we have our names. And finally, of course, active. Um, so we use participatory live coding, uh, so that's what we code along together, so you're not just watching someone code up at the front of the room. Um, we use an I, we, you teaching method, so I present a topic, we do it together, and then you do it yourself uh, to give you that guided practice. Our curriculum is open source and collaboratively updated to represent current practices. Um, Helpers, so we talk a lot about instructors. Um, but helpers are other people in the room that can individually help people. So that if you run into a challenge, you have someone there to help you. Um, and so you're not stuck, uh, you stay engaged, you stay active uh, with that helper. And then uh, formative assessment, so the sticky notes. Formative assessment is evaluating as you go, not waiting until the end and saying, how was the class when you can't answer any questions anymore? but the, the instructor actively engaging with the learner uh, to see where they are, to see where misconceptions might be and be able to address them and using that, uh, our sticky notes are our formative assessment methods. Uh, so those are the, kind of the, the key principles that we bring to our teaching and what we're hearing really and what I really have found is that, you know, I learned these things in carpentry, but I bring this approach to, to all my teaching. And we're seeing a lot of instructors doing that as well. And so we're not impacting just what we do in our workshops, but bringing these principles to other teaching scenarios um, scales the, the impact of our teaching because we're bringing more people in into whatever it is that we teach. And so, you know, are you wondering, you know, how much of a difference do I make? You're probably not wondering that because you probably get good green sticky notes. But maybe you're wondering. Um, and so if you are, we see, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our survey data. Um, this is just from the, the data carpentry surveys, but it's um, over 400, that's the long term. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about instructors. And so Francois Yushino made all these really nice thoughts. Um, so we have questions about our instructors. So uh, first is, the instructors gave clear answers to my questions. Okay, so you can see that our instructors are good, at, and all of you are good at answering questions. 
Instructors are enthusiastic. I love this one, right? So look at this, agree strongly agree. So I, I saw a quote that, um, you know, you go to the classroom for the enthusiasm of the instructors. You know, why don't you just learn it online? You go to the classroom because the instructor is excited about it. And your excitement at the front of the room, that projects onto the learners. And you can really see that they feel that. The instructors made me feel comfortable. Look at that, agree, strongly agree again. And the instructors were knowledgeable. Like, wow. Like, honestly, I like literally am getting goosebumps. I'm sorry. <laughs> because this is amazing to hear from this many people how much you mean to them and how how you project yourself. It's like, I don't know if you've seen a lot of survey results. These kinds of things are really, um, they're really special. And these are the kinds of words that people use to describe our instructors. You know, helpful, knowledgeable, teaching, explaining, um, solving, wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm surprised installation isn't in here anymore. Um, you know, personal pace, right? So uh, these are really positive words that people use and supportive words that people use to describe our instructors. Um, and this all means that people strongly recommend our workshops uh, to others. So um, this is actually from our, our long-term surveys. Um, so these are actually people who have recommended them. So uh, a major proportion of people who take a survey six months or more after they actually have like, recommended it to somebody else. And so I talk about the important thing being, you know, not that you walk away being able to write some particular arts and tax, um, but that students walk away with some confidence and ability to continue learning. So how do we do on that front? Um, so our con the confidence increases after just two days. So this is pre and post workshop. Uh, same question is paired data, so the same person. Um, we're matching those examples. Um, so the first question is, um, I know how to write a program uh, to do an analysis in my work. Um, so that's almost a full point change, pre and post. I can search for answers to solve my questions. Um, I can do, um, oh, I, uh, programming is important for reproducibility, so that's about perception. I can overcome a problem in my work. Um, I understand that programming can make me more efficient, and I understand that I should keep my raw data raw. We may be using those to just reinforce those points. Um, and then finally, that last one, you know, I am confident in my ability to program a small script to do work in my domain. And so again, that's a full point in just two days. So, and again, these are words people use to describe overall the workshops. And what's super cool about that is it doesn't just stop after two days. You don't just walk away and you're like, yes, I know it, I'm ready to go. And then you like hit the real world and you're like, oh, actually, never mind, right? Um, that happens to me on a fairly regular basis. Uh, so this is our long-term survey. So people who took a workshop six months or more ago. And so almost everyone is more confident now than before they took their workshop. And that is surprising to me because often as I do things, I become less confident in them. Um, so this is super exciting to see that people are maintaining this confidence even after they leave the workshops. And not only are they confident, but they're continued learning. So they continue to learn after the workshops, agree, strongly agree, right? Again, that's the important thing, not self-efficacy. And they say that these skills are impacting their work, um, improving their overall efficiency, ability to analyze data, improving ability to manage data, and then there's some people that aren't using them. So if we reflect back on that first question, how do we empower more people to use software and data um, to answer questions that are important to them? These workshops, they're doing that. People are telling us that they are using these skills, that it's letting them do their work. And what's super cool, they continue to engage with the community as well. So subscribing to the newsletter, Malvika's here, she does our newsletter. Thank you, Malvika, look how many people are reading it. <laughs> um, becoming a workshop helpers, instructors. Uh, so they're, they're seeing this and they're coming back to continue to engage with the community as a part of uh, their continued learning. Uh, they're also doing other things. They're using some of our, our online materials as self-guided learning. So going through it in the workshop, coming back, doing it after. Um, 
doing other short courses or online courses, going to meetups, um, participated in semester long courses. So there's lots of different approaches that people are using uh, to continue learning. And so, so that leads us to the next point, right? This is us teaching together. This is what our impact that we're having. Um, but we see that in that what's really important, that learning, to, that learning piece. That's what we're trying to cultivate in our learner community. But that's also what makes the Carpentries unique, I think is there's a lot of organizations out there that are teaching, I think how we teach, but also our commitment to continued learning. Um, and so there's a concept of a, a learning organization, and I was reading something, and I saw those words. I said, a learning organization. I was like, oh my gosh, that's exactly it. That's what the Carpentries is. We're a learning organization. And there is a, a framework for this that has five principles. Um, but what I think it really comes down to is that as a community, um, we are always learning. And we do this through this process of asking questions of ourselves and others. Um, so one thing is asking questions of each other, and I'll talk about the different ways that, that we do that. But the other is asking questions of ourselves. You know, getting to the end of that workshop being, how could I be, this be better? Oh, could I rearrange this? You know, what do I think about this? And all of my interactions with everyone in this community, they're asking themselves these questions. They're doing well, but always looking for what else they could be doing. And then that we listen and we think. And I super love the intro about uh, the unconferencing and participating because I had this same thing around <laughs> listening and thinking, right? Uh, and so the important part of asking questions is listening to those questions. What are those questions? Let's think about those questions, not to let them float into space, um, not to um, be defensive about what those questions might mean, um, but to really listen and really think. And then once we had a chance to do that, uh, collaborative, thoughtful changes. Um, so looking at what changes we might make, collaborating on them, asking questions through that process of making those changes. And then of course, iterating, right? We're never done. Um, and also, you know, we might make mistakes when we make a change. So we might need to go back and ask ourselves questions again. Uh, we're never done. And so this is really exemplified, I think, uh, all the way through the community and really starts uh, with our sticky notes. Because when we're in a classroom, uh, we use the green sticky notes uh, is, is, you know, if things are going well, put up your green sticky note. If you have a question, put up your pink sticky note. And at, we use this concept of, of minute cards. So at the breaks, we have say, turn in these notes and say one thing that you learned and one thing that you're confused about. And so right there in the workshop, we're asking that question. You know, what are you confused about? We're asking that question. Then people write these notes, they give them to us at break, we read them, we're listening to them. And then people come back from the break and we've responded to these questions, right? So if you see something that, um, you know, multiple people are confused about something, and you say, okay, great, let's revisit that. Or if you see it's a specific thing, you can uh, put some notes in the ether pad. So right away, we already have that whole cycle just there in a workshop. Um, so it really starts at the beginning where we're asking questions as we teach. It's reflected in our open source curriculum. Um, so we have 46 active lessons. Um, we have about 100 maintainers, and uh, we're just doing a lesson release right now, and that was more than 600 contributors to the last lesson release. Wow. <laughs> uh, so this is, every single one of these contributions is a question and an answer. Someone files an issue, someone puts in a pull request. Every single one of these, these are contributors, not contributions has two people involved in this, right? So we're constantly creating this structure where people can give feedback, that we listen, that we respond, that we make changes. And we see it in how we operate. Um, so this is a highlight, uh, a request for comments. So uh, earlier this year, we went through an RFC around our uh, code of conduct. When the Carpentries was forming, we went through a request for comments around our bylaws. Um, which is to put things out to the community, ask for feedback on them, include that comment, include that feedback, respond to comments, make updates. 
Um, and so that's another mechanism that we can use within our community to be learning about the elements of, our, of what we do, but also how we operate. So these are some of the mechanisms that we see that exemplifies the Carpentries as a learning organization. And what that means is that we still have a lot to learn. Um, and I think that that's especially true as we reflect on um, the Carpentries as an organization now is about a year and a half um, old. And so I, that's why the, the confidence, you know, in continued learning, I was like, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Um, so I think as we grow as the Carpentries, if we looked at that workshop map, um, in the last year and a half, we've really grown in the scale of our instructor training, in our community, even in our lessons, uh, <coughs> library carpentry uh, joined the Carpentries. So we've really grown as a community over that last year and a half. And it's raised some issues for us that we have to continue learning on. Um, so one in particular is around our community, as our community has grown. Um, and so we've spent a lot of time on our code of conduct with the RFC. Uh, but a place that we realize that we actually don't have good guidelines is incidents out outside of our code of conduct committee's process. Um, so ideas of balancing transparency and confidentiality. Um, how do we respond to incidents outside our community? How do we address issues in real time or before there are violations? So the code of conduct is a, is a mechanism that it can be seen as punitive. But there's lots of different ways to support our community through conflict. Because we're a learning organization, we're gonna disagree. And some of those disagreements are healthy and necessary and are around things that are important in our ecosystem. Um, but we might not handle that conflict in good ways. How can we help support um, that conflict, positive conversations? So that there's a lot we can do um, in this space to support our community better, to answer questions, um, and to help people feel welcome and safe in our community. Supporting and valuing our volunteers. Um, we do have so many volunteers that are so important um, in our community. How can we support and value our volunteers? Avoiding burnout, a standard challenge in open source and volunteer communities, and giving credit in a way that is meaningful to the individual. And this is something that, that Sarah really has highlighted as an important way of valuing our volunteers. What do we need to learn, continue to learn in our curriculum? Um, training and curriculum development. So we see a lot of that here. We're super excited about that. Uh, what are the guidelines in our curriculum development? Can we offer workshops and how to do curriculum development um, as we have these 46 lessons? Um, also, what are ways to support and develop community contributed uh, curriculum? So maybe not something that's a carpentry's lesson, but something that you want to teach in this in a different space. How can we have guidelines for contributions, review lessons? Um, and so we have this idea of carpentry's lab, um, where people can submit community contributed curriculum that we would want to develop. Instructor training, what are we continuing to learn there? Um, instructor training for people unfamiliar with the carpentries. So we're having more people in our workshops and instructor training that aren't familiar with carpentries. What does that mean for our trainers? How might they need to be prepared differently? How does that mean for the impact on our community? Um, there's an idea and interest in broadening instructor training for teaching other curriculum. So not just you come to instructor training to be a carpentry instructor, but our instructor training is broadly relevant. Um, people might want to use it for other contexts. Again, what does that mean for our trainer community, our mentoring community? What kind of impact does that have? And then scaling trainer training. There's a lot of interest in people becoming trainers. How do we scale that? How do we think about that? How are we recruiting trainers? And then finally, continued uh, learning in our operations. Um, so we have some key priorities. Um, so I think we have a good sense of who we are as a community. Um, but we don't have our value statements articulated yet. Uh, we don't yet have our vision statement. Uh, we want to make clear mechanisms for community feedback and engagement. So what's our request for comments? We've done a few, but we don't necessarily have a process we use every time. I'm using task forces to explore some of these challenges, uh, to make recommendations, do some more in-depth work. 
two by two committees that can link uh, committees from different places to talk to each other so that we have uh, conversations between different parts of our community and our committees. Uh, so there's a lot of different types of mechanisms. So how are we going to address, that was just some of them, <coughs> how are we going to continue to address these things? Like this list can seem pretty daunting, um, but I am not daunted because I've seen the challenges that this community has taken on before, and I see the approach that people take, and I'm confident that together that we can continue learning and look and answer these questions. And will it be easy? It will not be easy. There are always challenges, but I think that this community is prepared for these challenges, and not only prepared, but enthusiastic about taking them up, and we'll do them the same way that we do everything else which is asking ourselves questions and others questions, listening and thinking, and making thoughtful changes. And I put gratitude in the middle um, because I think it's important to uh, be grateful for this process and for people that are involved in it, um, which is a really core thing that holds this whole cycle together. Um, and this idea of being grateful for feedback, uh, so feedback can be really hard to hear, um, but it's important. And so we need to be open to it. And sometimes we have to separate out uh, the message from the way the message is delivered. And so being grateful for that feedback in whatever form it comes in. I'm not going to do this update right now, but okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, so all of our feedback. Um, and valuing all of our contributions. Um, so there's a lot of different people, ways people contribute to our community. And I have this empty box um, because there's so much invisible work that you don't see. Um, I think that, that we don't see. There's a lot of things that are sort of more public, but a lot of the things, the better it's going, the less you know about them. Um, and I think that all the people organizing the conference probably are very aware of that. <laughs> if we don't see a problem, it's because people handled it very well before it was an issue, right? Uh, and so some of the most important work is the invisible work. And so I do want to take this special opportunity to, to thank the people. And so this is actually a list of all of our instructors. Um, so Francois pulled this this morning, so it's very up to date. Um, and every single one of the people on this list is contributing um, just by being a part of this community, having gone through instructor training, giving their feedback in that workshop. Um, and I also want to thank uh, the people that do a lot of the invisible work uh, on the leadership side, and that's our executive council. This is this year's executive council. Lex Netterbrock is here. Um, and Randy Silva worked at SSI. Um, so these people, they're the ones that are also listening to your feedback, uh, to everyone's feedback, to doing work on bylaws, uh, things that, uh, things that necessarily like wouldn't raise to the top in terms of thinking about what the Carpentries does, this operations that keeps us going. And I also want to take this opportunity for a special thank you to the staff. Um, you probably see a lot of them in your emails, um, but they work hard every day, and I am so proud to work with this team um, because they really exemplify the Carpentries values and ethos around feedback, about responsive, about community they care, about like each and every one of the people in our community. And I just want to thank them so much and tell them how fortunate I am to work with them. We have Francois and Sarah and Cher Aaron here today, so I can say thank you to them as well when they're here. So if you want to go fast, uh, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, and that's kind of this further together hashtag um, because I, it's really important uh, for what we do and how we do it, um, where we can get in reaching more people and sharing uh, data and software and this idea of democratizing data. So thanks some of our, our funders. And we now have um, around 83 member organizations. So these are organizations that are doing something, kind of talking about the global space here, but the member organizations are looking to build local capacity. So um, these communities, within communities, um, where they can connect with people on their, in their area, in their geographic region or organization. And so as we go into this conference, 
Uh, we can take the same spirit of teaching together and learning together. This is such a great uh, agenda that we have here of all these people that like signed up like, please let me share this thing. I want to teach this thing. I want to talk about this thing. Uh, so we have so much of that here. Uh, and so we can ask questions of each other, listen to each other, think about changes we want, might want to make. And I think I have a few minutes left. So I have two sets of things. Um, so I'll take some questions, but I also want to give you uh, a few minutes as we go on into this conference to turn back to the person next to you and tell them one thing you're hoping to learn at Carpentry Connect Manchester. And the thing about this is the person next to you, they might be able to help you, right? You might say, I'm looking to learn this. and say, oh great, you should talk to so-and-so. Well, let me introduce you, right? Because it's hard to walk up to people or you can't you know, necessarily see across the room. Or you should go to this session, or I found this great resource. So, or but maybe you don't, you're like, yes, I wanna learn that too. <laughs> Let's go find this person together. So I'm gonna take a couple minutes, turn back to that person you introduced yourself to, and say one thing that you're hoping to learn at Carpentry Connect Manchester. <laughs> questions you have um, and I've said a lot in this conversation about we um, and that's always how I talk about the carpentries because it's who we are um, but also so here I am also a person and I <laughs> like feedback as well uh, not just me so I do want to um, let you know that you always can reach out to me uh, about questions comments um, anything that you want to share and sometimes I get behind in my email, um, I will admit. Um, but I read everything and I will uh, respond and I want to hear what you have to say. So I want to ask here, what questions do you have? Um, so here we can have a little bit of time for questions, but I also have this here, um, that's just a Google form uh, that you can fill out that you can ask questions to, so I won't look at that here and like answer them. But if you have a question that you don't want to share, or you just want to let me know something, um, go ahead and fill out that form, uh, and, and I'll read it in a little bit. So, uh, thanks so much, and yeah, let me know what questions you have. I have a question about how to work within institutional structures where all time and space is costed and where there isn't necessarily a funding structure for continued professional development. And how do we get the carpentry's values and volunteer ethos to interface well with that? Um, so how do we get the carpentry's ethos to interface with institutions that might not share our values or approach to working? Um, yeah, sneakily. Um, so uh, it's a, that's a really good question. I get, I really like how that's phrased uh, because like, kind of the question sometimes is like, how can I change my institution? It's like, well, you can't change your institution. Um, and so the carpentry is actually, we take a bottom up approach to changing institutions, um, which is to get carpentries in as workshops um, and to start to get more people that share that approach uh, to teaching and engaging with other people and having it percolate up. <laughs> um, so we do work on both sides. So, um, you know, what I like to think, what can we do now, right? So what we can do now is that we individually uh, can work this way. We can encourage other people to become instructors, support them um, in that, support them, help them teach a workshop, like do logistics for them, let them focus on the teaching. 
And then the other things that we do, like at kind of a, a staff or executive council level, is we are trying to influence um, institutions. So we serve on advisory committees um, or other conferences around like inclusive data science and environmental science. Um, and so it's kind of coming from the top and coming from the bottom. Um, but the funding source is a challenge. Uh, so in particular, it depends how you pitch it. So Elizabeth Williams, who's our director of membership, has like different sort of slide decks depending on the administrative level um, because they're interested in different things. So you wouldn't pitch to like a VP for research. Um, people will feel really good about these workshops. That's not what their um, return on investment is. Theirs is on like research output. So it says you have all of this data that your professors have spent millions of dollars generating and it's sitting on hard drives. And if you want that research to have an impact, to get grants, to get papers, you're gonna to need to teach people how to use that data so that they have the high impact research papers. Um, so it is about understanding what's important to the person that you're talking to and talking about the training or the curriculum in ways that match their interests. Even when we think that that's not necessarily the thing that they should most value. That sort of help. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> I'd be happy to talk more about that too. Okay, I've got a, a question about measuring the impact of work that we do. So I know the carpentries are doing the long-term survey, oh, yeah. but do you have what other ideas or plans? <laughs> you have for measuring the impact, showing the world what we do and our institutions and our funders? Yeah, that's a great question and I, I love ideas. I think um, this is challenging, right? So this is all self-reported, right? Like, I am doing better work because of carpentries, right? Like, um, but how do we really measure that? So again, thinking about what funders care about, it is about grants and papers, right? Uh, often. Um, and so we've thought about metrics around um, like tracking, if you had like people's DOIs that went to a workshop and then you could track DOIs and see what papers they're publishing and how much of a quantitative element they had, that would be a very long time, you know, that they take the workshop now, the paper comes out in five years, right? Um, so that would be kind of a, a harder thing to look at. Um, that might be one mechanism. I think the other really interesting one, though, is around collaborations. Um, and so I think we see that people, even within like carpentry community the instructors, are like collaborating to write grants or do research together. And so I think it'd be really interesting, uh, like network analysis type of things about um, connections between people, like instructors in our community, and, and their um, their production might be an interesting thing to look at. Um, I would love to hear more what you had in mind. And I think one of the things to think about is that if we want to measure something, we have to have the mechanism in place to collect that data. Um, and so we want to be thoughtful now about starting to collect information that we might want to, to evaluate later. And we do, we are very sort of strong about privacy also, so you know, we always take that into consideration too. We would prefer to not have a metric than to have something be not really in line with privacy. So we think about that too. You should tell me what ideas you have. <laughs> if people have thoughts on that, that would be really interesting. Because again, different places have different things that are important to them. Um, so we would like to hear uh, what's interesting to people. So we've got a feeling we might want to leave it yep. there to give time for the nice people. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much.